By one o'clock, thousands of Parisians surrounded the Bastille. Inside, the 114 soldiers stood nervously by their guns. The crowd surged forward as far as the first gatehouse. By now, the governor was the last custodian of royal authority in the city. Yet he was paralyzed by his indecision. Should he open the gates or open fire? In a last desperate attempt to avert bloodshed, a delegation went into the Bastille to persuade the governor to hand over the Bastille's powder supplies. Delaunay took his time answering. He assured the delegates that he would do nothing to harm the people. He swore that his own men would not open fire unless they were attacked first. But he refused to give up one grain of gunpowder. Outside the Bastille walls, the crowd was growing restless. The meeting was going on too long. Fearing that the delegation had been captured, the crowd renewed their attack. Events now span out of control. Two citizens managed to cut the chains to the outer drawbridge. Thinking the governor had given in, the crowd surged forward. They were tragically mistaken. Some soldiers opened fire. Humbert, the watchmaker, recalled, it was horrible. One poor man was killed outright and another injured, but no one seemed to notice. No one knew who fired first, but we all quickly ran for cover. Some never made it to safety. Within moments, the courtyard in front of the royal prison was strewn with the blood of commoners. From that instant, everything changed. The crowd had come for gunpowder. Now they were out for blood. Against the stout walls and cannons of the Bastille, muskets were useless. Then, about half past three in the afternoon, 300 armed citizens arrived to help storm the Bastille, along with 62 deserters from the King's army, towing a weapon to even the odds. The arrival of the French troops was a turning point. The rabble became an army and the melee became a siege. In the inner courtyard of the Bastille, the deserters leveled the guns at the second drawbridge, the last remaining barrier to victory. Delaunay had no training as a military commander and was hopelessly ill-equipped to deal with the angry crowd. The crowd had suffered heavy casualties, but the arrival of the cannon now gave them the opportunity to strike back. The soldiers in the Bastille had little faith in their governor. One later wrote, a man without much courage. He would listen and agree to our advice, and then he would do just the opposite, before changing his mind again. As the afternoon wore on, the assailants wanted more than ever the destruction of the prison and its arrogant governor. was facing defeat. He knew once the second gate was breached, his tiny garrison would be overwhelmed. 
Vas-y, vas-y. Go no longer thought of saving the Bastille, only of saving his own skin. He knew that his troops could not hold out much longer. The governor decided to gamble. He still had a cellar full of gunpowder. He would tell the crowd if he had to die, he would take his attackers with him. He composed an ultimatum for the mob outside. He wrote, We have 20,000 pounds of powder. We shall blow up the garrison and the entire neighborhood unless you accept our capitulation. From the Bastille at five in the evening, July the 14th, 1789, Launay. When his officers learned of his threat, they begged him to reconsider. De Launay ignored them. The governor had his men signal for a truce. At first, wrote Humbert, we thought the white flags were a trick and ignored them. But when De Launay himself appeared, the crowd met him at the locked gates. words of his ultimatum rang out like bullets. Angry at the death of their comrades, the crowd was enraged by the governor's attempts to blackmail them into surrender. No terms. Down with the drawbridge. No terms. 